I'm going to take a smaller bite tonight because we're going into something that's brand new. Uh, but let, we need to talk to the Father because we need our minds quickened. We need our spirits quickened. And we need our ears to be opened. So, Father, that tonight we just ask that you would open our hearts, open our minds, open our, give us hearing ears and seeing eyes, that we might hear the depth of what you're saying. Plant something in our spirit, even if our mind doesn't catch it. Plant in our spirit the seed of truth. Because you are coming in this last hour to destroy every yoke. And we need all of the anointing that's available. We need to learn how to access it, how to pray into it. And so as we take this lesson and, and work with it, Father, I ask that you would cause questions to arise that will help us make things clearer. Father, as we discuss this later on in the lesson, let questions come that help us make things so clear that we can catch the essence of what you're saying and you can begin to work in us to make it possible for us to carry and steward properly these things that you're releasing in these days. We pray in your precious name. Amen. So this is Understanding the Prophetic and the Prophet, Lesson 11. And this has been inserted because of a question that God asked me. And I figured if he asked me in the middle of this course, he wanted me to share around it. We tried this at an intercession session and everybody got overwhelmed. But it's because... <laughs> It's because that God is challenging us to grow up. And so let's, the seven anointings that destroy the yoke. And this is lesson one, and we've divided this uh, subject up. and going to have a discussion later on because it's so, so important. So let's look at some review. Now, that I, have, I can't remember whether I've said this purposely, but this is something that most of us will catch because we've heard it at least once before. In Hebrew, most words have gender, either male or female. Although there are some neuter gendered words, they are comparatively few in the Greek and the Hebrew and the Aramaic. The Spirit of the Lord uses a male gender. The other six use female gender words. If, if this suggests, is this suggesting that they are expressions of the feminine characteristics of God? Remember, God made man in his image. In the image of God created he them, male and female. He didn't create the woman in the image of the man. He created the woman in his image. And that's what we have not taught in the body of Christ. And so women have tried to be men in order to fulfill their calling. Therefore, they see, we are called to display him. We're not called to display ourselves. We're called to display him. And if I don't know him, how can I display him? Okay. Remember, both male and female were made in his image before the fall of the species. This changes some of our understanding of the nature of God and of the seven spirits. It also changes some aspects of understanding why God built the woman. woman. Remember, it says that God formed man out of the dust of the earth. And so when God is working with men, it's usually by pressure, and the forming of their character and nature. But when God is working with women, it says God made the woman. The word made is act, should actually be tran translated built. And so when you're working with a woman, you build her. You don't form and shape her. You don't bring her under pressure. 
you form, you build, and God's got to teach us how to do that. Now, by the way, that's my my approach in counseling women. What can I do to build them? Remember, God has both masculine and feminine characteristics. And re catch this and let it sink deep into your being. Remember, he's greater than any words we can use to describe him. No language has the words to describe his character, his nature, who he is, and what he has, and what he wants for us. So language is a, a weak communication skill. That's why God has to reveal himself to us. There, the theologians know him by the book, but kingdom people know him by experience. They experience him, and he tells them what he's doing, takes them to the proper scriptures in the word, and they understand the scripture by experience, not by academia. If academia could have it, I would have it. I got more degrees than a thermometer. All right. God said he made man in his image. Genesis 127. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Now catch this. The precursor position or image was the in his image position. We are not in the image of God as such right now. We are the fallen image. We need to ask God to show us the full image. But the outline, we are the outline. We're not the fullness. One can draw from this that God is both male and female characteristics. And I've called this the power of the fullness of an anointing. In Isaiah 10 and 27, and it shall come to pass in that day that his burden shall be taken away from off thy shoulder and his yoke from off thy neck. Those, a burden and yoke are two separate things. Some people have the yoke destroyed, but they still have the burden of tradition on their back. Let me say that one again. Some have the yoke destroyed. They're no longer yoked to sin. They're no longer yoked to relationships that are bad for them, but they still have the burdens of tradition. Jesus said to the Pharisees, you put burdens on men's backs that you yourself will not help them carry. And that's the problem with tradition. Tradition will put a burden on you and not help you carry it. Okay? His yoke shall, uh, from, and his yoke from off thy neck, and the yoke shall be destroyed because of the anointing. I want to emphasize this because we always work. This was quoted to us that the anointing breaks the yoke. When I found out the anointing destroys the yoke, I began to pray differently. A broken yoke can be restored. A broken yoke can be fixed. I know because we had oxen at the Christian community where I was, and, and the, uh, the ox master was able to, he was a, just a phenomenal young man, he was able to fix the yokes that broke. Now those oxen were strong. They would pull a tractor out of the mud. They had to, but they had to have the yoke to do it. The anointings are fullness in the area they're titled for. And we'll get to some of that a little later. One grows into the ability to steward these anointings. I cannot overemphasize that. There are, are anointings that come with the gifts. There are anointings that come with ministry. But these seven anointings we grow into and they rest upon. They are not resident within. And they are needed for this end time. They're absolutely essential that a people grow up into these anointings. Because remember, not only do the children of God grow up in the end time, but the enemy and all he is working with and all that are serving him 
grow up into their fullness as well. 666 is the fullness of the soul of man. Then that is inhabited. And remember, did you ever stop and think about before the fall, Adam named every animal, every creature, every plant out of his soul. That's the power of the soul. Now, Watchman Nee wrote a book called The Latent Power of the Soul. The only problem with that is it's so negative, it's difficult to read. It's not balanced. If you want to balance it out, read T. Austin Sparks, uh, oh, what is it? The Spirit, the Law of the Spirit of Life in Christ Jesus. Powerful power, but it balances out the book, The Latent Power of the Soul. So, it's, and it's important that we let God grow us up so that we can steward these anointings. They're like mantles which God gives in each of these paths or emphasis to enable one to come into the full expression of Jesus for that subject. Remember that Jesus is the fullness of everything. In him dwelt all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So when you're talking about the seven spirits, he walked under all seven. The body of Christ in this end time, those that grow up to maturity, the individuals have, will have an emphasis of one of those, or maybe two or three of them, but not the full. Why? Because the body of Christ in the end time is going to manifest the fullness of who Jesus is. That is going to revolutionize. It's either going to cause people to rebel or fall in. We are coming to the days of the greatest revival this world has ever seen. Those are not just words. That's going to be a reality. And by God's grace, I'm going to be here to see it. In April, I turned 77. I tried to turn that around, and it still says the same thing. But I got a, word, a prophetic word the other day that said I'm going to return to the days of my youth. So I'm going to pray into that one. Yeah. All right? These anointings have destructive power against the enemy's deception and human understanding of these realms of influence. This makes them weapons of spiritual warfare of the highest level. Divine enablements. Samson, it says the Spirit of the Lord came upon Samson. It was expressed in the spirit of might because of what he did under that anointing. That's how you can tell what he had. David's mighty man, the guy who defended a bean field and killed 300 people. Samson with the jawbone of an ass. Thousand. Samson, in his final prayer, killing over 3,000 people under the spirit of mind. We've, we like the uh, positive results of these. But God also, in the end time, is going to judge his people. You know, in the book of Revelation, I said, God... When you pour out the judgments, how's that going to go? You know, I'm a bit curious. He said, you're going to do it from your knees. The prayers ascend, and is it chapter 6? The prayers ascend, and they're offered, and then they're poured back out upon the earth, and then are released the judgments. So it's prayer that's going to, an intercession that's going to release the judgment of God when that time comes. How many know we're going to have to have a right attitude? Okay? Yeah. So the seven spirits and gender, and this is from uh, Brown, Drivers, and Briggs, which is indexed to Strong's. The spirit of the Lord is masculine. The spirit of wisdom is feminine. Now that's very clear in Proverbs, isn't it? The spirit of understanding is also feminine. The spirit of counsel is feminine. 
the spirit of might is feminine. Isn't that an interesting? The spirit of knowledge can be either male or female. The spirit of the fear of the Lord is feminine. So in 1 Corinthians 1.25, because the foolishness of God is what? Wiser than all men. And the weakness of God is stronger than men. The Lord said, that's why I made these others feminine. Because the feminine side, according to 1 Peter 3 and 7, is the weaker vessel. So the weakness of God is stronger than men. We need to pray into that. We need to say, Lord, make me a manifestation of your weakness. That wouldn't go over very well with the macho men, would it? All right. His anointing expresses. These seven can be expressed through, and I didn't talk about this the other night, girls. But this came as I was looking at it, because, again, we've tried to consolidate everything under one nice little box and title. When God expresses himself through multiplicity. So the prophetic insight, the eyes of the Lord, and the reason I say it's insight in the motive is because it says in Chronicles that the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth, seeking to make himself strong for those whose heart is towards him, is perfect towards him. The heart is the sense of the motivation. God is more concerned about your motivation than how you motor. Or it's their motivation. <laughs> so sad. Uh -huh. You need to pray for me. Yeah. <laughs> but are you hearing me? The word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, even to the dividing asunder of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of what? The thoughts and intents or the motivations of the heart. God is looking at my motivation. And I call that the eyes of the Lord. Number two, the light of God and fire, the seven lamps, seven expressions of the consuming fire of God. <coughs> Our God is a consuming fire. Isaiah says, who shall dwell with the consuming fire? Who shall dwell with the everlasting burnings? He's saying there's a people that can do it. But it's a people who've let God process them, and they have become his expression in the earth. There are, if I had time to teach it, I'd teach on the laser, the laser light. Because the power of the laser light can cut through metal. The power of the laser light is so focused that thousands of miles away it'll still be focused. They've got low laser cannons now that they can, if they were to turn them on a satellite from Earth, they could shoot the satellite of the sky. That's the power of light, folks. God wants us to put on the armor of light. So there are seven lamps or seven expressions of the consuming fire of God. Number three, the promises of God. Because the rainbow is also called the seven spirits of God that's around the throne. It destroys the yoke of the lies of the devil. The promises of God destroys the yoke of the lies of the devil. The old course is whose report will you believe? All right. The seven mantles or anointings rest upon destroying specific yokes of the enemy. Number five, the seven aspects of the power. The seven horns are on the, on the lamb, aren't they, in the book of Revelation? There are seven aspects of the power of God, but there are also the trumpet in Scripture and the ram's horn, or the shofar, speak of messages. They're blown when messages are released. Now, my personal sense is that the 
The trumpets in Revelation are the silver trumpets because that fits the seven feasts, doesn't it? That fits the... Uh, Numbers calls them the instruments of war. Two silver trumpets. And they're blown in the last days because God is going to release messages that have never been heard before and they're rhema words. Once he releases that, we'll find it everywhere in Scripture. But until he does, we won't even know it's there. Isn't that the way with the revelation God's given you? You didn't see it, and then all of a sudden you find it everywhere after he opens it up. And God is going to do that in the end time because we're going to need fresh instructions that have never been released in the earth before. And those are in Revelation 8, number 3. <clears throat> well, let's go back to number 1 in that session. The horns can also represent messages as in the blowing of the silver trumpets or the shofar. Two, the revelation trumpets are blowing of the silver trumpets in Revelation 8. Three, because one of the representations of these seven is the horn on the lamb, it's, it is definitely representing a shofar, shofar. And by the way, to me, my understanding would be those are seven revelations of the Lamb that we are going to need in this end time. God can anoint any of these expressions and use that manifestation to destroy the yoke that is represented. How he works this out and which expression he wants needs to be clearly led by the Spirit. The reason I say that is we tend to want to put it in a nice little box. God blows our coffins, I mean our boxes. Okay? And he's going to continue. If we have traditions that are not of God, he's going to blow them up. Defining yokes. The unequal yoke. You like my picture of the unequal yoke there? <laughs> the anointing can destroy the old and yoke you to Jesus Christ. Matthew eleven twenty nine. 29. He said, take my yoke upon you and what? Oh, you mean it's a school. I cannot understand the yoke when I first put it on. It's a yoke of learning of me. Take my yoke upon me, you and learn of me. There is some learning of him that the church must enter into that has not been released. Then there are personal yokes as well as God wants us to allow his anointing, that God wants us to allow his anointing to destroy. I used to carry, see that fellow with the yoke on? When I was in Christian community, I was that guy. But I didn't have nice stuff in the buckets. We composted human waste. That was stinky. Let, let me tell you a story. I almost forgot to do it one day. So someone is going with me and they're carrying the flag. I've been counseling and remembered and I said, come with me, give them a flashlight. And I went to the different outhouses and, and took the buckets and we're walking down, taking a shortcut to, the, to the, the place to dump it. And I lift my foot and under my foot goes a skunk. I did not move. And I let him go up over the wood pile and down the other side before I moved. <laughs> but look at the other picture there. I, I have seen somewhere, I wasn't able to find it on the internet, but I've seen men yoke, with yokes on pulling plows. So I was looking for that. All I could find is this, women pulling plows. This is what the church has done to women. Thank you. 
god came to set them free and to destroy the yoke remember this i'll just say this and then we'll run okay <laughs> but what has happened is the church has taught the cursed position Remember, before the curse, there was no difference. They both had the same responsibility. You can't find any difference before the fall. The fall set in line the curse. And the church has taught the curse position. God wants us to, to bring us back through. Remember, the cross brought us into what I call the neither realm. In Christ, there is neither male nor female, neither Jew nor Greek, neither bond nor free. He brought us into the neither realm. So we come through the cross into the neither realm. And unless we're set absolutely free into that realm, we're still in a cursed position. Jesus nailed the curse to the cross. Every bit of it. Okay? That's my soapbox, but I'm not getting on it today. All right. But when I saw this, it reminded me of many of the churches I've been through and what they taught. God came to destroy the yoke. So the spirit of the Lord is the covering spirit. It's the male spirit or the male expression if you could call it that. But here's the thing. I said, Lord, how in the world am I going to find out which anointing destroys which yoke? And that's a very valid question. But he asked me the question, so I had to go and search. By the way, it's the glory of the Lord to conceal a matter. It's the honor of kings to search out a matter. So if God asks you a question, he's challenging your kingship. He's asking you to qualify to be a king. Search out the matter. By the way, in God, women can be kings and men can be brides. All right. We just want to get all this stuff out there. Then you can stone me afterwards. But wait till after. All right. In Isaiah 25, 7 and 8, and he will destroy in this mountain the face of the covering cast over all people, and the veil that spread over all nations. He will swallow up death in victory. It is the Spirit of the Lord that destroys death. It's the Spirit of the Lord that destroys the covering that is blinding the nations. He will swallow up death in victory, and the Lord will wipe away all tears from off all faces, and the rebuke of his people shall he take away from off the earth, for the Lord has spoken it. God is about to speak some things that are going to change the dynamics of what's going on in the world. Yeah. Ezekiel 28 and 16, By the multitude of thy merchandise, they fill the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned. Therefore, I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God, and I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. That's Lucifer himself. It, it, it's going to take the full anointing of God, the Spirit of the Lord, to destroy Lucifer. By the way, he's going to do it through his people. God could snap his fingers and that'd be done with. The whole third that fell would be eliminated. But he wants to show to the principalities and powers the manifold wisdom of God by the church or by us. Lord, help us to qualify to be those who manifest the manifold wisdom of God. The spirit of wisdom destroys the yoke of Isaiah 29, 14. I will proceed to do a marvelous work among this people, for the wisdom of their wise men shall perish, 
and the understanding of their strate stra strategists or prudent men shall be hid. God is going to destroy, not just break the strategy of the world, not just break the wisdom of the world, destroy the wisdom of this world. He's going to do it by raising up a people who walk in the wisdom of God and under the anointing of the spirit of wisdom. In 1 Corinthians 1, 18 through 21, I like this. The preaching of the cross is what? Some people want to do away with preaching. God says, no, foolishness of, cross, of the cross, or the foolishness of the preaching of the cross, for it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? How? By his foolishness of preaching. For after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God that by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Some would say it's not logical. No, it's not. It's not logical. Don't even try logic and reason on this one. Okay? If God says it's foolishness, accept it. And be foolish. <laughs> I know. Sometimes we just have to believe what he says and ask him to show us how to manifest it. Anointed preaching destroys the wisdom of this world. This is not always immediate or obvious destruction. Included in this is the logic and reasoning of men. 2 Corinthians 10 and 5 talks about casting down vain imaginations or vain reasonings. How does he do it? By the foolishness of preaching. 1 Corinthians 2, 5 through 7, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Howbeit, we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor the princes of this world that come to naught. It is the wisdom of God, and the, in the end time, all of the wisdom of this world will be brought to naught by a people who've qualified to walk in the wisdom of God. Listen, there's so much in God yet to be released. We have, you know, J.B. Phillips wrote a book years ago. I never read the book, but I did read the title. Your Jesus is too small. And God is magnifying him in our sight these days. He is becoming greater to us. And as he becomes greater, our vision expands. And what he can do and will do. And what he's going to release in these days. Proverbs 9 and 1. Wisdom hath what? Build it. Oh, you wisdom is a construct, uh, construction person. Build it her house. She hath hewn out. How do you hew something out? Cut it out. Cut it out. Yes, to some extent. But did you ever watch some of those old movies where they're building log cabins? What do they do to those logs? They take the ads and smooth them out with the ads. They hew out the logs to set one on the other. Wisdom hews out seven pillars. And those seven pillars are found in James 3, 17 and 18. Wisdom's, the builder's pillars. The wisdom that cometh down from above is first, what? Pure. Purged by God. Peaceable. Blessed are the... I'm reading that one day and the Lord said, Blessed are the peace emitters. I carry peace. So when I come into a room and there's conflict going on, for some reason it settles and nobody knows. 
It's because I carry peace. Gentle, meek, firm, but not rigid or legalistic. How many know that's a, not an easy one? Because we think to be firm, you, you can't be firm and gentle at the same time. That's the wisdom of this world. But Jesus was gentle but firm. Okay? And so, if I'm going to manifest that portion of his character and nature and that portion of his wisdom, I must let him cut off of me all that is not gentle. He has hewn out this pillar of wisdom. In other words, it has cost me something. I have been in pain from time to time as the ads of God took away excess. Easy to be entreated, approachable, full of mercy and the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians 5, 22 and 23. Without partiality, no Republican, no Democrat, no new uh, conservative, no liberal. In Canada, what's the other one? New Democratic Party, Party? none of those. How many know that we have politics in the church? Lord, deliver us from evil. Because in God, there's no party spirit. There's only one party. And I must align with him. Okay? And I must seek him until I get his will and purpose and word on a situation or circumstance. Without hypocrisy. You know, back in the early days of computer... They came to a screen about three or four years in and it said, what you see is what you get. That's without hypocrisy. Now, I was studying wisdom one day and I pulled this from one of my other studies because wisdom hath builded her house. So we need to see some of the building concepts of wisdom. The word of wisdom in 1 Corinthians 12. That is the basic understanding of wisdom. God gives you a word. It's not the whole thing. It's not the whole plan. It's just a word. And that wisdom is like a key that unlocks something. But if I listen to the word of wisdom that God gives me, I can become a wise man or wise woman. Many move in the word of wisdom but never become wise because they don't put in their storehouse things old. Every experience God takes me through, I can learn wisdom from it, and instead of just being a man who can hear from God and speak wise words, I can become a man of wisdom. And you see that often in Proverbs. Then there's Isaiah 11 and 2, the anointing of wisdom. But in this case, the anointing of wisdom is not the highest. Jesus is made unto us wisdom, sanctification, and redemption. I can manifest the wisdom of Jesus because he lives inside and I let him grow up in me. That's the highest level of wisdom. So I was just typing along and the Lord said, you've got to parallel or show the difference between God's wisdom and the pillars of foolishness. I said, what? How many know that sometimes it just blows your mind? All God has to do is give you one phrase and you're just... So I said, Lord, you're going to have to show them to me. I know they're there because the Bible talks about the foolish woman. Look at Proverbs 14, 1. Every wise woman buildeth her house, but the foolish plucketh it down with her hands. And then the Lord said, both of them are in you. I said, yeah, I rebuke you. He said, we often, with one set of words, we build something. But then with our life, we go against what we've said and tear it down. 
When I did that, I said, Lord, would you convert the foolish woman in me? So, coming back to these pillars of wisdom, pur of pure, purged by God, the equivalent of the foolish man or the foolish woman is the works of the flesh, the immorality in Galatians 5, 19 to 21. And remember now, the, fool, or the wise man built his house. Luke says he dig deep and built his house on the rock, right? Yeah. The foolish man built his house on the top. He didn't dig. Some days I think God is still digging, but listen, if God is digging, the rock is in there. Let me say that again. You should shout by now. <laughs> if God is in there, if God is still digging, there is the rock inside that he wants to build on. Sometimes we think God is punishing us. No, he's digging to the rock that he knows is there because he wants to build on the rock so that when the rains come and the winds blow, <coughs> the rains of blessing come. Hello? How many know that rain can be a blessing and rain can be a curse? When it begins to flood, even though it's rain, it becomes a curse. The rains came and the winds of doctrine blew. I mean, the winds blew. The winds of doctrine blew upon both houses. The house on the rock stood firm. The house on the sand or the foolish man's house crashed. Second of all is peacemakers. The, the pillar of wisdom is peacemakers. The pillar of the foolishness is division. Number three, the gentleness, the meekness but firm in the pillar of foolishness is cruelty. The pillar of wisdom is easy to be entreated, approachable. Number four in the foolish man's house, arrogant, unapproachable. I mean, no, we can have both. That's the thing that scares me. Okay? Number five, full, mer full of mercy, the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5, 22, 23. In the foolish man's house, no mercy, legalism. How many have been touched by legalism? How many have been hurt by legalism? How many are being healed from legalism? And we need to realize we... We can be healed. Even these, even that negative territory in us can be changed. In God, the wayside can be turned into good ground. In God, the thorny, uh, thorny ground can be turned into good ground. In God, the stony ground can be turned into good ground. Or God can grow hydroponics. All right. The, the, the beauty of salvation is we don't have to remain as we came. Number six, in the wisdom is without partiality or no party spirit. Foolishness is a party spirit or taking sides. Hello. I know we live in, quote, a democratic republic and we vote our people in but that should not ever be in the church number seven without hypocrisy what you see is what you get number seven in the foolish man's house was hypocritical you command one thing and do another it's interesting that jesus said do what the scribes and pharisees say but don't do as they do In other words, the scribes and Pharisees were building foolish houses. The spirit of understanding destroys the yoke. 1 Kings 3 and 9. Give therefore thy servant, this is Solomon crying out to God, an understanding what? 
not an understanding head. In North America, we think if we understand it with our head, we got it. That is false. We do not understand it until God writes it on our heart. Give therefore thy servant an understanding heart to judge thy people, that we may what? Discern. Discern a spiritual skill, not a deduction, not the gift of suspicion, but a spiritual exercise. That we may be discerned between good and bad. For who is able to judge or the word in the original is discern this thy so great a people. God brings us into situations that we do not have the wisdom or understanding for. On purpose. Because he wants to grow us into an ability to understand. And he wants us to reach into God for the spirit of understanding that will cause us to see something. The spirit of understanding destroys injustice, bad judgment, manipulation of truth, and can destroy the bad. First Chronicles 12 and 32, And the children of Issachar, which were men, were men that had understanding of the times, to know what Israel ought to do. The heads of them were 200, and all their brethren were at their command. Number one. The spirit of understanding destroys misunderstanding of the times. How many have read some stuff on April 8th and the, the eclipse? Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Yeah. And there are many postulating a lot of things. There's some prophetic stuff out there, or at least it purports to be prophetic stuff. But why are they always focusing on the negative? Yeah. Think about it. God is a God of balance. He's not going to bring judgment without an answer and a way for people to avoid the judgment. Second of all, a misreading of events. Now, there are prophets who read events and see clearly, prophetically, what's going on. Okay? So we're not speaking against that, but we're just saying... The spirit of understanding destroys the misreading of events. The spirit of understanding destroys the misinterpretation of Scripture. Have you ever been there? Oh, yeah. Issachar's men were strategists, prophetic in nature to hear from heaven what ought to be done. What about a whole tribe of prophetic strategists? That's under the Old Covenant. How many have read our covenants better? Lord, bring us into the maturity where you can release that to the body of Christ. The spirit of understanding destroys the yoke. John or Job 26 and 12. He divided the sea with his power. By his understanding, he smites through the proud. Isn't that interesting? It's not by a spirit of might. It's by the spirit of understanding. He smites through the proud. 28 and 28 of Job. And unto man he said, Behold the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. And depart from evil is understanding. Now here's what the Lord dropped into my spirit on this one. I will need this anointing in the last days to be able to fully depart from evil and kick out of me any remaining lusts of the flesh. Folks, we can say the body of Christ, we can say the world, we can say the church. I'm, I am part of the church. And if he's going to, if this operation is going to function, I'm going to have to let him deal with all evil in me. Okay? Let's stop blaming others. Let's begin to look within and say, God, you know, um, some of the revelations that have come along recently about certain uh, men of God that got caught up in sin. 
I said, God, why didn't, first of all, why didn't the prophet see it? And I said, whoops, sorry, God, why didn't I see it? I can blame them or I can question my level. Lord, bring me to a level where none of this can happen, but I see it. I understand it. I hear from God on it. I know how to react. And I keep my attitude right. It is not ours to attack those who have fallen. It's ours to get down beside them and help them get back up because they fell among thieves. Please hear me. The wisdom of God is restoration, not condemnation. Lord, deliver us from that human tendency to be condemnatory. By the way, when we condemn, the devil has a heyday. He rejoices because we're agreeing with him rather than the prophetic word that God says, I will restore. Yeah. Psalm 119, verse 34. Give me, an un give me understanding and I shall keep thy law. Yea, I shall observe it with my whole heart. To be able to completely keep the law of the Lord and do it, I will need the anointing of the spirit of understanding. This anointing helps deal with the lawlessness in me. Uh, lawlessness, pardon me. Mm -hmm. Proverbs 15, 21. Folly is joy to him that is destitute of wisdom, but a man of understanding walketh uprightly. It will take this anointing to destroy the folly in me and cause me to walk uprightly in the last day. All hell is going to be arrayed against the church of the living God. It's going to take all heaven to raise up a standard. The spirit of understanding destroys the yoke of Proverbs 16, 22. Understanding is a wellspring of life unto him that hath it, but instruction of fools is folly. The spirit of understanding destroys the yoke of death because the spirit of understanding is a wellspring of life destroys the yoke of death and replaces it with the wellspring of life. Lord, untap that wellspring of life in me. So wherever I go, I minister life. Proverbs 21, 16. The man that wandereth out of the way of understanding shall remain in the congregation of the dead. Lord, keep me in the way of understanding. Proverbs 17, 27. He that hath knowledge spareth its words. Uh-oh. That alone is going to take some work, right? <laughs> he that hath knowledge spares his opinion, uh, his words. And a man of understanding is of an excellent spirit. The spirit of understanding gives me the ability to keep my mouth shut. <laughs> How many need that anointing? <laughs> the spirit of understanding defeats a wrong spirit and gives me an excellent spirit like Daniel. Because the queen mother's testimony of Daniel is he has an excellent spirit. The world could see it. The thing that I, I really, um, in reading that, it says, and light. He had light. How in the world did she know the ungodly woman, unsaved woman, know that he had light and it was in the Old Covenant? There's some things we don't yet understand about the fullness of the Old Covenant. And our covenant is? Better. Better. You're going to get that before I'm done. <laughs> the spirit of counsel. Anointed with the spirit of counsel. <clears throat> Second Samuel 16, 23. And the counsel of Ahithophel, which he counseled in those days, was as if a man had inquired at the mouth of God. That's what the word oracle means. 
so was all the counsel of Ahimethel, both with David and with Absalom. So it's a clear word directly from the mouth of God. How in the world are you going to defeat that? The spirit of counsel came upon Hushai. He gave counsel, and the Lord, it says, the Lord caused Absalom to choose Hushai's counsel. When, by the way, Ahithophel was probably about 80 years of age. No, he had been all, he had been one of the major counselors for David all of David's um, life and ministry from the throne. But God caused the spirit of counsel to defeat Ahithophel's word. It destroys the yoke of psychiatry and psychology. By the way, remember this. Psychology and psychology only deal with the soul. They don't deal with the spirit. And most of our problems are rooted in the spirit, not the soul. So they, can, they may even be able to diagnose the problem, but they can't fix it because they don't know how to apply the principles of God and of the spirit to the situations. Okay? Identify with the Christian counselors and psychologists and psychiatrists. All of them. Listen, what... <clears throat> I wrote what, three courses on Christian counsel, and it was because I saw a huge hole in Christian counsel. Okay. And the Lord spoke to me. Well, let me tell you this story. I'm at I'm at the college. And we fly out for a for a, a intensive seminar a whole week at this uh, location where we had an extension school. And the psychologist could only stay for two days. And it was a five-day thing. So I'm sitting in my room getting ready for my class. The president of the college walks in and says, you're going to teach the psychologist's class. I had not had any psychology. I had never cracked a psychological book. I had no clue what was in those books. I said, God, what do I do? He said, you... Look at the books. I'll outline something for you and show you how to teach it. So I had three, three days to teach that. And I said, Lord, something's missing. The next time we went out, back out to that place, I rode out west with the psychologist. Wonderful man of God. But caught up in the psychological thing of the world. Trained as a psychologist. And we talked, and again, they handed me his stuff and said, you're going to fish it. The third time I went out, God had dealt with me on the way home. He said, I want you. I said, Lord, what's wrong with this? It's good stuff. What I taught was good stuff, but it's not from their books. I used their titles, but not their book. So I could say I used the, something from their book. And he said, the problem is they do not know man after the maker's manual. I said, I made the mistake of asking the question, what do you want me to do? <laughs> he said, I want you to look at every scripture on spirit in the word. How many know that's a big assignment? I looked up every scripture on spirit in the word and I said, now God, what do I do with this? He had me go through and pick out and highlighted to me the characteristics of the negative of the spirit and of the positive. He said, I want you to start with the negative because flat power flows from the negative to the positive. He said, I want you to detail the negative and then I want you to show them the positive. So I did that. And I was part way through the course and we're flying out and I said, Dr. Hamley, would you take and look at this? Do you think you'd have time to look at it while you're here and get it back to me before you leave? He said, yes. So he read what I had done. I hadn't even finished the whole thing. He read what I had done, and he and I became friends for the rest of his life. He put me on the board of their counseling uh, organization. And all I did was pick out, and then, then I went on to look up all the scriptures on the soul of man, 
I wrote The Anatomy of the Spirit, The Anatomy of the Soul, and uh, The Philosophy of Spiritual Counseling, and taught them at the college. Why? We need to know man from the Maker's Manual. Then we'll not be surprised at the actions of man. We get surprised at the actions of Christians who haven't dealt with all their stuff. Okay? What we need to do is no man after the maker's manual. The spirit of counsel will help us go there. It's being defeated in war comes from the spirit of counsel. Or do you, yeah, all right, let me go here. 2 Samuel 17, 14, And Absalom and all the men of Israel said, The counsel of Hushai the archite is better than the counsel of Ahithophel, for the Lord had appointed to defeat the good counsel. It was good counsel. It was right counsel. But the Lord had appointed to defeat the counsel of Ahithophel to the intent that God might bring evil upon Absalom. It took the spirit of counsel resting on Hushai and God turning that in order for God to win the battle and David to take the throne again. So Psalm 5 verse 10, Destroy thou them, O God, let them fall by their own counsel. Sometimes God just takes his hand off and lets their own wisdom destroy them. Cast them out in the multitude of them, their transgressions, for they rebel against thee. Psalm 33.10, The Lord bringeth the counsel of the heathen to naught. It takes the spirit of counsel to bring the counsel of heathen to naught. He maketh the devices of the people of none effect. Proverbs 15.22, And folks, here's why some of our spiritual warfare has not worked. Without counsel, purposes are disappointed. But in the multitude of counselors, they are established. The purposes of the enemy and the purposes of man are destroyed when we allow those who speak the counsel of God to speak into our lives. Proverbs 20, verse 18. For every, or every purpose is established how? And with good advice, what do you do? Sometimes we go into spiritual warfare without counsel. Guess what? It smacked around pretty good. Purposes are established when the spirit of counsel is functioning and heated. It is often in tandem with the spirit of might, which is God's anointing for spiritual warfare. Some of our battles are not won because we do not ask God to place upon us the spirit of might. Listen, remember this. God said to Israel, the enemies you're going against are mightier and stronger than you are. That has not changed. Proverbs 24, verse 6, For by wise counsel thou shalt make thy war. And in the multitude of counselors, and this is in the warfare council, there in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. So the spirit of counsel destroys the strategies of the enemy. You can learn the strategies of the enemy if you listen to the spirit of counsel. Psalm 33, verse 11, The counsel of the Lord standeth how long? Forever. And the thoughts of his heart to all generations. So, this is where the questions I've stirred up get discussed. Maybe not answered, but discussed. Any questions? Yes, give give her the mic, please. This is for those online who can't see you. They hear a voice and see no woman. <laughs> so in listening to all of this, one of the, the scriptures that comes to mind is that of Ecclesiastes 9, I think it is, where it says wisdom is better than warfare. 
And I was just wondering what your thoughts were on on that about that man, you know, that it was like a little pro, like a little proverb about how he went into a village and his wisdom was so great that he helped them win a war. <laughs> wisdom. There's an incident in the life of David where Joab went to this city and he besieged the city and a wise woman, that's why I like it, a wise woman came to the wall and said, we're at, uh, said what do you want? He said, we're after this one. He, she said, if I throw him down, will you save the city? The, what, the wisdom prevented the war. And you'll find several places in Scripture where it talks about a man or a woman of wisdom being used to prevent and save thousands, probably thousands of lives by one act of wisdom. Abigail and David. Abigail and David. Yeah. Yeah. Because David would have killed not only Abigail, he would have not only Nabal, but all, yeah. all Nabals, and he had many servants. He would have killed them all. But Abigail, by the way, she was also a prophetess because she reminded him of the word of the Lord to him and she wasn't there when it was given. Any other questions? Wasn't that also with Moses when the Lord was so angry with the children of Israel that the Lord said he was going to walk away from them and Moses said, if you do, what would the Egyptians say? Right. Isn't that wisdom? That was wisdom. It actually, he, he basically said, they'll say you can bring them out, but you can't bring them in. Sometimes in prayer, you have to use God's own words against him. That's what Moses did, isn't it? You said. By the way, when Israel was cutting up, God said they were Moses' people. Yes. <laughs> and when they were good, they were his people. <laughs> how, how, how much like a father and mother, right? <laughs> we have got to begin to know Scripture, at least the sense of it so well, that we tap into God's heart on issues and situations rather than try and reason them out and discuss them out and all that to negotiate them. We need the wisdom of God. Honey, can you give us an illustration when you say the purposes are established when the spirit of counsel is functioning and heated? It is often in tandem with the spirit of might, which is God's anointing for spiritual warfare. Well, the spirit of counsel, uh, when the spirit of counsel is upon the warfare counsel, okay, to get the wisdom needs the spirit of counsel, but to, to accomplish the war needs the spirit of might. In, a, in other words, to carry out the counsel requires the spirit of might. What and how? Well, okay, let's let's look at the incident we're talking about, the Hibbethel Hushah. No, I'm saying that's the what and the how. The what's and the how, yeah. And the how to do it. Yep. Did you have a question? Yeah, I do. You want to pass her back the mic, please? People online, this might help too. You made a comment about the, the power flows from negative to positive. Right. Explain that to me. Uh, I was... <laughs> I, when I started the church in King... Go ahead. What power are we speaking of? Holy All, power. Power? All, All power. power. Okay. All okay. power. Okay. So this is... Okay. Yeah. It's a principle. It's a scientific principle. That's what I think. Okay. Not and uh, I was counseling this lady who'd, who'd become my associate in the 
We started out as a house church, went to building and so on. But her husband was the head psychologist at the local hospital. So he came in, he said to her, you're learning good counseling skills, but don't use them on me. <laughs> and he was, he, he'd been an electrician before he became a psychologist, or probably while he was going through earning his money to be a psychologist. And the Lord asked me to ask him, because I, I knew that factor. And I said, sir, which way does power flow? He looked at me and he said, from the negative to the positive. I said, exactly. I said, I'm counseling her to the positive. We're dealing with the negative and going to the, yeah, restoration. How, how, does, how does that coincide with the spirit of atrophy? Because isn't, aren't we, have, haven't we been taught, been taught that everything is in a, it's a deteriorating state? You know, when you're born, you're, you're dying from the moment you, you're born and everything is constantly. But, but see, the yeah. thing is, we're called to move from the natural to the spiritual. Okay. Okay. The so natural is a negative, laws. isn't it? So those are natural laws. Yeah. Which spiritual laws would suit. True science, science never contradicts scripture. Okay. Right. Okay. 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 And so often God will allow us to come into a negative situation because he wants us to move to the positive. Mm-hmm. Let, let, let me illustrate this. We had, uh, back in 2010... Um, 2011, wasn't it? Yeah. Back in 2011, we had a family come to us that uh, escaped from satanic ritual abuse. The mother had 260-some personalities, the six-year-old had nine personalities, and the four-month or the six-month-old had four personalities. And Needless, they could only stay for 90 days. We had intercessors with us 24-7. But we watched God move them from the negative. Uh, They were just in our home. We didn't lay hands on them. We didn't try and cast demons out of them. We loved them. And one day, the little girl says, Come quick, come quick. Mommy's having trouble. We went to mommy and we found a pin coming out of her ear. Just being in the positive atmosphere of the presence of God brought that thing out. I had to burn it. I could, it couldn't destroy it otherwise because it had been put under, in under demonic influence. What kind of a pin? It, it looked like a straight pin. No, it looked like a staple. Yeah, like a staple. But three of them come out from three different places while she was with us. The presence of God had that effect. And they were forever changed. They didn't get free because they had to go back and they were captured immediately. But just six months ago, they come out and have stayed out. So what anointing, what spirit works there? The Spirit of the Lord was in, in the house. They they would go to the door. We'd leave the doors unlocked. They'd say, <laughs> huh? They'd say, open this door. I said, it's unlocked. Well, tell your blank angel to, to get away from it. No, I'm making supper. <laughs> they could see the angels. One time they tried to climb, climb out the second story window and the angel pushed them back in. The power of God on that property. They said they'd never seen so many angels in one place. I would go out almost every day and blow the shofar and the silver trumpet. And then I'd go right, get on the riding lawnmower and ride around and anoint the perimeter of the land. And the... Uh, the handler from their country came over. They didn't know where they were for a week. Came over and couldn't get any closer than a mile and a half to our place because of the presence of angels in the valley. He played worship music constantly. Played worship music. 
Did you ever, you know John, who John Paul Jackson was? He made a tape of the names of God. We would put it on. Finally, we couldn't find it. They brought it out the last day they were leaving and said we hid it because it bothered us so much. <laughs> and all, all John Paul Jackson did was read the names of God. We do not know the power of what we have. Why? Hmm? Why? My people are destroyed for... And what we've tried to do, and I've said this several times, but it's true, we've tried to condense everything down into one nice little package, when God is too big for any package. And one of the things that this is doing, I hope, is expanding our perception of Him and what He has for us and how He wants to enable us. And what is available to us to fight these battles. Anyone else? Yes. Give that gentleman the mic. Would, would it be safe to say that um, the down payment that we received in lieu of us getting our full inheritance, uh, would it be safe to say that, that down payment is actually more than what we've been using? Absolutely. Yeah. Remember, all the, 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 on the day of Pentecost, they only got the earnest of their inheritance. All the gifts of the Spirit and the ministries are only in the earnest of our inheritance, and we're not using them to the fullest. That is so good. That's great. Wow. Wow. Isn't that what, that what the um, is it Colossians or Ephesians says? We have the earnest... Or the in what one brother put it this way: the interest on the money. We're not even using the full interest. Now I know in the in the world some people have enough money they live on the interest. But God wants to take us past the interest into the full inheritance. And much of the church isn't even living on the full interest. Is it a little clearer? Huh? Is it a little, little clearer tonight? Yeah, the muddy water is not quite as muddy. <laughs> it'll, it'll take a while in all of this because yeah. God is, and by the way, when it says in Corinthians, knowledge shall increase, it's not just the knowledge in the world. It's the knowledge in the kingdom is increasing. Mm -hmm. And it's coming faster and faster. And God, God gave us this promise. He said, in the end, I'm going to do a quick work and cut it short in righteousness. That means he's going to do the whole job in one generation. And I have this sneaky prophetic suspicion that we are that generation. I think too, Gloria, you've been... Yeah. I do. This is what I heard. You've been walking in some of this with spiritual warfare. You just weren't aware of what you were walking in. But now God's bringing a clarity. You've been doing it, just not absolutely sure. But being faithful to warfare. So now God's giving you clarity as to what goes with what and as it becomes more clear to you you're going to go oh yeah okay that's what that was just saying Okay, let's pray. 
Lord Jesus, we want to be yoked to you, yet we recognize that there's some negative things in our lives that have been there all our lives. Because of that, we do not even realize we're yoked to them. Come, reveal them to us and give us the grace to allow you to destroy them. Show us how to choose to be yoked to the person of Jesus Christ and not a human concept of what that looks like. Our hearts are crying out to be free, to fully obey you. Any yokes that impede that yoking come and remove them, we pray. Let whatever level of anointing that will destroy them come and do that work. Prepare us for this work to be done. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. All right. Lesson two. Next week.